Hello. Sorry I'm a bit late. Um, that's definitely Blue Collar Loser's fault because he's running late and we were waiting for him. And definitely not because I was on a date and I lost track of time and then I had to rush home. That was definitely not the reason. Anyway, uh, we are back. We're going to be focusing on one show in particular that we want to talk about a fair bit. Um, but, of course, we'll be tapping into some other things as well. Now, as you can see, my uh, my name has changed. Not by Depot. This is because I was on a Fletch stream last night. And uh, we were doing comedy names. But I probably should change that back, shouldn't I, really? So, you know, you can tell I'm well prepared uh, for tonight. So let's do that quickly. Right. Uh, no comical suggestions, please. Um, let's just see who's in the chat. Keith, of course. Sorry, Lance, I'm running late. He's run two red lights already. Don't run red lights on our behalf. Take time. And Drew Gordon is here. Good to see you. And Dan Candy is here. And so is Northern Bastard. Hey, evening, y'all. And hello, you beautiful bastards. How are you all doing? Not too bad. Um, yeah, we, we, we were a bit tight on time. Now, Stepenzo has been at, uh, I think he was at a festival. Yes, I'm uh, hoping he's still alive. <laughs> and he, he, he sent us a picture of the toilet uh, at that festival. Should we, should we show people that picture? What do you reckon? Yeah, he'll hate us for it, but for sure anyway. <laughs> I think we should. I think we would be re remiss in our duty if we did not show you the Stepenzo toilet experience. So, um, I might, <laughs> I might get in trouble with YouTube, but uh, hey. So I'm, I'm not going to look at this picture, but this is, uh, this is Stepenzo last night at his festival, checking out the latrine facilities, and uh, that has to be said. They, they look. I think he's also got an astronaut's uniform on him. Yeah, <laughs> I wondered that as well. Is it, I mean, is he is he been on on the Challenger? Is there like a Challenger experience at the? Oh, hang on, that was the one that blew up. Has he been on at the Atlantis? Um, I don't know. Uh, and again, I don't mean any disrespect about the Challenger there. That's just, just the first when I think of the ch shuttle. That's always the first name that comes in my head. Um, but he does look like he's about to go to NASA somewhere, doesn't he? What was that yeah. movie Armageddon? Looks like he stopped <laughs> off the set of Armageddon. Um, so at the minute, it's me and Luke and uh, from up north. And we will be joined by Blue Collar Loser when he safely arrives home. Uh, we, we want him to arrive home in one piece. I've got to take down that picture of that toilet. I don't want to look at that. Even off to the side, even off to the side on my, con, on my computer. So, um, uh, View to a Kill was Dolph's first um, acting role. Yeah, okay, I, I might have been wrong about that. I yeah, thought, I don't uh, know. It looks like it would have been an early appearance, but um, it's yeah, I wasn't too sure either, to be honest. Yeah, I got uh, the order of Rocky Four and View to a Kill ran the wrong way. That was yeah, yeah. Cheers for uh, sharing that, Dan. Yeah, Mr. Brown is in the chat. Uh, I haven't watched Shogun today yet. Have you seen it? I've not watched it today, but I will watch it tomorrow. I we will. will be reviewing Shogun tomorrow night um, at 10 o'clock as per usual. Um, but tonight we're going to cover some other things. And one of the shows uh, we want to talk about is Parasite the Grey. Let's get the uh, picture up. I don't know if um, Blue's been watching it. Um, premise of the show is it's a Korean show. Um, premise of the opening shot of the show is that these strange, small globules are, they look like plankton. They're kind of dropping through the sky from outer space. Uh, they land in a football stadium where there's a rave. And when they come to the ground, they're kind of like eggs. And this sort of leech like thing comes out and crawls inside one guy who is uh, sleeping. And um, what these uh, aliens do is they immediately feed on the brain 
and take over the host body and they survive by eating the brain matter slowly taking it over and also by emulating the host so it's a little bit they're not infectious so one can't infect someone else and then someone else and then someone else it's 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 one alien per body um so there's a bit of the thing in there but but not not the infection part of the thing there's a bit of body snatchers in there but not the eggs part of body snatchers where they're trying to multiply um so and then i guess uh there's one girl who, the main character who we got a picture of there who ends up being slightly different from the rest i don't want to get into spoilers too much but she kind of um potentially can be the person who can save the human race or destroy it i suppose yeah she's gonna be um, yeah she's gonna be the one that's gonna have that uh very aggressive side and fighting against it i can tell i can really tell you're not wrong um there are six episodes it's all out on netflix now um these are the spores that come down from space in the poster she's basically a regular checkout girl um i uh, forget the name of the actress in the in fact i'll get her name up because I don't want people chastising yeah. me for doing things wrong June, like they did last week. Yeah, June Sun. Let me look. I'll look it up. Sorry. Okay. Well, she's uh, she's pretty good. Yeah. Um, quite impressed with her. Um, I think um, Victoria. Oh no, that's the wife. Victoria Grace plays the wife. Um, uh, is it John Sunni? Is that Sunni? Yeah, John Sunni. I'm, I'm really hoping I pronounce it right. Or is it? Yeah. Um, and then, anyway, there's a there's a this is one of the other main characters. Um, he's kind of a low level thief who gets caught up in a gang war, is betrayed, um, and ultimately ends up in the fight with the aliens. This lady had her husband taken over by an alien. She's also kind of the equivalent of a woman who works for the CIA. Uh, yeah. She teams up with local police. They have kind of a special forces unit that is trained to take on the aliens yeah um, she, she has really yeah she is really taking this personal as well she's obviously had a yeah. life ruined by all this and that's why she's a little bit uh out there as well she's a little bit crazy well you find out later that they took her ear off so a bit of a spoiler yeah, there, I but, know. But that's what i mean find... yeah so um yeah she's a, she's a pretty cool uh character um as well i like her character um yeah, so and this is what happens to our main character when she when the host takes her over. Um and she's a kind of a half breed, which is interesting. There's a lot of action. This is what the alien looks like when it comes out of the spore. So it's dead tiny and it does a wrath of Khan number, goes through the ear. Pretty unpleasant. And then this is what the aliens look like, the regular aliens. Yeah, good little um, uh, body hole there. Yeah, I have to say that the CGI work in this film is pretty good. Um, I wasn't taken out of it. I was, I was kind of, I just like the design of the aliens. They're quite unique. I mean, we have seen similar things, but but it, not quite the same. I thought it got a little better as the episode went on, but uh, when it, when I first saw it, I thought oh, it does look a little bit like uh, PS3, like. I don't know. That's my opinion. That well, when you when you see them close up and the people are like right next to them, because I don't think you've seen all the ep episodes yet, have you? No, yeah, no. But I did. But yeah, when you're right, it did start to look somehow. It looked a little bit better when they were close up. Yeah, the close up, the yeah. close ups. It's really detailed. It really looks yeah. like a practical effect. I'm pretty sure it's not. I could be wrong. Maybe there is a mix of practical effects. I hope so. Work. Yeah, I like the fact that you could almost see uh, the cheek uh, torn open when uh, it mutates as well. You can see the teeth through the side of her face. Mm. Uh... Ah, they're talking about the eagle has landed in the chat. Um, have you seen the special edit of that, which is about 15 minutes longer than the original release and has a scene with Hitler right at the beginning? I don't think I have seen that extended cut yet. Uh, I've still got the old battered uh, DVD where it's got the 4.3 ratio. 
Yeah, no, I got the um, anniversary release that came out for the, whether it was the 25th or 30th anniversary. It's a two disc set. It's got the original cut of the film in it and the extended version. Uh, I also have 800, which is a very, very good movie. Annoyingly, mine is Region 1. Um, but I actually oh, got man. to see that on the big screen. There was a there was a one off screening of it in London, and I I went to see it on the big screen. It's good. That's a good. Yeah, movie. we don't really get enough Chinese World War Two movies. We get a lot with the Japanese and the and the Nazis, and I think we rarely see the Italians. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll, we'll oh, hang on. Let me mute that. We'll cover. Um, I'll talk about Eight Hundred in a bit because that's actually a film worth mentioning. So, um, and it's um. Yeah, I mean, it's mad. The action sequences in it are uh, pretty crazy. Um, so, right, uh, let me get that. that. That came out in 2020. Um, so what episode are you up to, Northern, on this show? Yeah, still on the first one, because I've only just got <clears> on to watching it because I was watching Ripley as well for the stream. So, and that is, that is actually looking promising as well. I, I want to try and really... Watch both these shows. Yeah, we'll get on to um, Ripley yeah. in a minute. I forgot to put that on my scrolling text, so I'll change that now. Um, yeah, Ripley is. Um, oh, that's a whole other. That's a whole other topic that we'll we'll get to. Um, yeah, I would recommend it. I mean, okay. So the the big gripe I have with it is you have to buy into a certain nonsense logic in this world. I, it, seems be, yeah, it seems to be the case with a lot of the Asian programs, especially yeah. Japanese anime as well, because they're, they're, they're yeah. kind of out there. It's a bit like Jaws is at the beach and, um, you know, you've got to, um, uh, you've got to evacuate the beaches. No, because we want to earn money. And with this one, it's like, uh, there's a music festival. We're not going to cancel it because it makes all the money in the region. Um, but there's aliens running around killing people and changing into people. Yeah, but we don't want to cancel the music festival because we don't want that region to lose money. This is nonsense. Yeah. It's like probably do that now. Like a shark out in the water. <laughs> so you've got to sort of buy into this certain nonsense that people are going to prioritise making money at a music festival, which is like the, you know, it's like the thing at the end of the fog. We we don't want to cancel the anniversary uh, celebrating fifty years of Antonio Bay. We don't want to cancel the opening weeches of the beaches. Um, at the beaches in Jaws, and welcome, blue collar loser. Eat his uh, burger. Uh, thank god uh, you guys. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me take you out so you can finish eating. Um, I'll give, I'll give him a couple more minutes to get a couple of big bites there. Didn't realize he was halfway through the burger bite there. Um, take your time, Chris, don't bolt it so quickly. So, um, yeah, you've you've it, it is that's what's ridiculous about it, but I think if you just kind of Go with that and just accept that that's bollocks. Um, it, it's okay. Uh, these aliens create massive meat lockers because they feed on human flesh. So th that obviously provides ample opportunity for some suspenseful scenes. Um, I think it's good. I give it sort of probably seven and a half out of ten. Um, if you can just ignore the nonsense, higher even, because it is very watchable. It is a lot of fun. You do care about the lead character. And the crazy police boss lady is, her scenes are just fun to watch. And there's big action sequences in it, especially one scene on a bridge. There's a lot of scenes with people getting, you know, crushed and killed and all of this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Apparently it's based on a manga as well. It is. That's it's correct. It's been adapted into two lab action films in Japan in 2014 and 2015. So, yeah, yeah, this 
I think this could be a spin off or in a separate universe. We don't know yet. Kind of hoping it is. It'd be good to see it, this whole universe here. Wow. Are you, uh, how you doing, uh, Blue? I'm telling you, like, it, it sucks nowadays with apps, man. Everything is apps. It's like, hey, I'm not paying 10 bucks for a cheeseburger at McDonald's, but I'll pay two bucks for a cheeseburger at McDonald's <laughs> with the app. <laughs> <laughs> Down, uh, have you, Lou, did you watch this show? No, we've. Oh my god, it's been a, it's been a hectic week. I saw four movies this week, so yeah. Well, you can tell us about those oh, in yeah. a moment. <laughs> um, what four movies did you see? Uh first one was Monkey Man, by okay. uh, it was the the debut directorial debut for uh, director Dave Patel was his name. He also wrote it and screenplayed it and produced it, and this guy's busy. He acted in it, like man. Yeah, tell, us about, tell, tell us well, about man. it in a tell us about it in a little bit. What else did you see? Um, so I find I got to see the uh late night with the devil with uh Dave DeSmallchin. And yeah, as Gord King said, uh fantastic film. Dave DeSmallchin is a great actor. I am very happy this guy's getting more recognition, and he is so so charismatic. And the guys he's he has leading man potential. I'm well, 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 yeah, I agree. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Uh, what were the other two? Oh, um, what uh the first omen. Which, uh, yeah, the first Omen. If you, you were mean told, the original Omen film from 1972, so apparently this is a prequel to the Omen. And oh, you, know, okay. you know what, Lance, you could watch this film and go right into the original Omen, and it does work. And I am blown away the fact that in 2024, a prequel Omen film is actually good. It this could be the year of horror films, man. Everyone's talking about these horror films. And what what's the fourth one? Um, try to remember now. Something on Netflix. I've seen too All much right. stuff this week. <laughs> well, uh, you've got uh, you've got a few minutes to find what that is. Yeah. Oh, Let's see. Back up. Okay. That's well, uh, yeah, Shogun is tomorrow. We haven't all watched um, Shogun yet. This is more our general chat show, but hang around, Jammer, because we talk we cover interesting yeah. things here. Um. So, well, my recommendation is if you haven't seen Parasite the Great, it is worth your time. You do have to buy into a certain nonsense of logic, but it is quite fun. It is quite interesting. It's 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 like I say, seven and a half out of ten for me. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to do a second season. Um. So yeah. Anything else you want to add about that, Norman? Uh, what this scene here? No, just the show generally. Before we move on. Well, it does seem very interesting, and uh, I'm, I am liking a couple of the characters. And once again, female leads in these Korean shows seem to be portrayed so much better. They come across as real people, but at the same time, they've got a strength to them. And yeah, I think she's. I've, I sympathise with this character already. She's uh, got this uh, force inside of her, but it can't fully take over. Wow. And I'm going to see. I think we're going to see some very complex character building here. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, you you do get quite a lot of character arcs with the show. Um, it's worth um, yeah, it's worth your uh, time to watch for sure. Uh, Blue, I'd be interested to well, I'd be interested to hear on both your sure yeah views next week when you've I check it out completed watching it. Okay, uh, as you as you can see, I'm currently Chevy Chase. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. let me um let me just change that let me just change that quickly oh lance the fourth film was uh seeing in god we're all old but the 25th anniversary for the matrix i brought my son to see it for the first time in theaters and again some films are just meant to be seen on the big screen yeah matrix is good on the big uh, screen. i have not watched matrix since it came out so it's the first time I've seen this film in two decades, and my son was just blown away by how good that film is. Oh my god! <laughs> um, well, let's move on then uh, from Parasite the Grey to Ripley. Now, mm. I have to admit, I binged this show in two days. I saw, I think there's eight episodes. Um, I saw six of them in a row. And I'm very interested to see what other people have written about it. Hmm. Um, and then I saw the, the remaining two episodes uh, the following day. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen the talented Mr. Ripley with um, 
Matt Damon in the lead role. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the same. The The Ripley books are three books. Um, the Talented Mr. Ripley is the first book. This is a mini series based on that same book. So it's a very different adaptation um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's all set. It's all shot in black and white. For me, that's one of the strongest elements of the show. Um, secondly, the casting is very, very different. Ripley is older, which I think is problematic. I'll come back to that. Um, and there are some other significant casting changes, one of which I just think is nonsense and doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's a pretty good script. Um, some other characters have been cut out, and I don't think... It, the show really suffers because of that um, with good performances for the most part. The photography is just gorgeous. Uh, almost every other shot looks like a painting. Um, and I dare say there'll be some of them here, but uh, who else has seen it? I'm keen to hear people's thoughts. First I'm hearing about the first one today. You watched the first episode. Yeah. But I do. I, I was kind of agreeing with you on the the age thing because he's because Ripley in the original film was young. One he was, uh, he was like in his twenties. He could. He's it, the, 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 the character in the movie. book. Somebody yeah. told me, and I haven't read the book. The character in the book is supposed to be thirty three. Uh, Andrew Scott is in his fifties. He could Victor. pass for forty. Damn. But he I can't pass. <laughs> he, he can't pass. He can't. He's. I think he's fifty now. He can't pass for thirty-three. Um, he, you know, as much as he works out and all of that. Um, and and Ripley. I mean, also Matt Damon has a very boyish, young face. Yeah, because he could get away with a, a lot more, couldn't he? He had a. He, he had an innocence. He had an innocence to him. Well. <laughs> Andrew Scott kind of does look like he's someone I wouldn't trust, to be honest. Yeah, Dakota Fanning is really good in this, exceptionally good, actually. Um, she says so much with so little dialogue with her face. Um, it, it really is a act acting masterclass. For anybody who hasn't seen um, the uh, original story, without going into too many spoilers, um a sort of New York family who come from money, who've got a lot of money that the, they've kind of, their son has become a bit strange from them. He's gone and moved to Sicily uh, in the sixties. He's kind of become enamored with it and he just likes staying out there and lounging around on his, on his yacht and trying to, trying to learn to paint. He's a terrible painter, got no talent to speak of. Um, the father locates a friend of his who was at a party that his son was also at once and pays for him to go to Italy to talk his son into coming home. Ripley decides he wants to stay there, so doesn't try too hard to bring the son home. And chaos then ensues. Um, Ripley also starts to sort of steal people's identities and really is a kind of bit of a sophisticated criminal, although not as sophisticated as he thinks he might be, um, which is some of the joy of the the show. I mean, this does look amazing. It, it, it's an absolutely fantastic adaptation. Feels very Elliot, Elliot well, Sumner plays the role of Freddy. I don't think Freddy's in episode one. This is the... Um, child of Trudy Styler and Sting who is doesn't identify with a particular gender um, Freddie is clearly Freddie's played by Seymour Hoffman Philip Seymour Hoffman in the movie um, those are very big shoes to fill and um, the performance was okay it was just very the gender thing with it was very distracting because I just thought, I know that this role is supposed to be a guy and um, it's fine making it non-gender specific, but why? Because this is based on an established property. 
It's a book. The characters in the book are either male or female. You've said it in the 60s. You're not modernizing it. It's not set in 2024. If you were going to set it in, reset it in 2024 in Italy, which wouldn't be as good because it wouldn't work because you'd have texts and phones and emails and all these other things. You don't have any of that communication. That's why he has to go to Sicily. Why? Why Why have we gone with this cast yeah. vision? Um, and I, I just, if somebody said, well, they were the best person for the job of all the people we saw, they blew me away. Their performance is okay. They're, they're talented. They're, they're not bad. But I just think it's a distracting choice. I just think this is an established property. These are known characters from a writer. You know, if you're going to adapt the work and you're going to keep it in the period, you know, adapt it as close as you can. I just found it so distracting. And, and every time I'm, they were in their scenes, that was all I was thinking about. It, it totally took me out of the the show which is not the idea anyone got any other thoughts they want to say about that that is actually putting me off uh, watching it because if that's yeah. uh... don't 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 i want to hear your thoughts on it when you've seen it don't there's a lot yeah. to enjoy in the show don't not watch it i don't, don't like the cinematography i don't like the cinematography and the acting is brilliant it really is i just yeah. uh, like i said the uh the allow uh, the actors to bring a bit of body language without so they can say something without actually saying anything at all and I do like that but like you said the age thing yeah he needs to be a little bit younger he needs to because Matt Damon did have a bit of an innocence to him like he could use that innocence to, yeah. him to get in yeah. on his side yeah he did that was what made it interesting um, Dakota Fanning is absolutely superb in this yeah, really she's super nice. there again. She was because she kind of dominated the 2000s as a kid. She was great in Man on Fire, War of the Worlds. Even she even outacted Robert De Niro in Hard and Seek. And all of a sudden, she went quiet. And now it looks like she might be coming back on top again. Well, people, you know, they go and do other things and that sort of stuff in it. Um, I guess. Um. But uh, uh, Johnny Flynn is is pretty good in the show as well, it has to be said. That role in the movie was played by Jude Law. Um, <clears throat> I, quite, I, I think I preferred Johnny Flynn in this role. Um, it's one of the sort of tense dinner scenes. But, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it really is. Look at that shot. What, what the black and white does for the show is it gives it this kind of like film noir kind of yeah. gumshoe. Looks nice. You know, oh, it was it's like... in New York, that kind of vibe. Um, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell people don't what don't not watch it. Drew said it's killed his interest. You definitely should watch it, mate. But, um, it is a weird one. I didn't like the, the talented Mr. Ripley when I first saw it because I remember coming out the cinema and saying to my friend, who are we supposed to be rooting for in that film? Because M Matt Damon ultimately was the bad guy and everybody else, and it was horrible. And um, that's kind of the same dilemma that you have with Saltburn. And Saltburn is supposedly a ripoff of Ripley. It is. Absolutely. That's totally true. It's totally... Um, a rip off of Ripley. Um, Les Bitches, the Claude Chabrol 1968 film is a gender swap redo of Rip Ripley. It's eighth. So, I mean, I could buy that. I'd, I'd kind of be interesting to see that. Um, <coughs> but when you're, you're messing with the gender of a specific character, it just feels a bit odd. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's Netflix. Um, they had to tick the box. They had to tick one box, didn't they? Yeah, this actor's really good. Um, Maurizio Lombardi, Italian. He plays like the detective. Uh, he's great. Gwyneth Proutro's character is not... Oh, that was Dakota Fanning's role, wasn't it? No, yeah, yeah. So that's the same role. Soundtrack is good. Soundtrack in the show is good. Um, 
Yeah, there's a cat. The Kate Blanchett's character is not in this. So Kate Blanchett, I think, was in the talented Mr. Ripley. That that character is not in this version. So, um, yeah, I think she yeah. was a likable character. It's been a long time since I've seen her. Maybe Jack Davenport's character as well. Jack Davenport's character is not in this version. No. Yeah. He's got a great line, isn't he, in the original movie? Um, oh, I bet you've been rowing him all over Italy or some, something like that. <laughs> sort of crack, cracks you up. Um, yeah, I'd give it... Uh, give it 7 out of 10. I think if, if they had... Tackled the issue of Andrew Scott. Uh, if they put some uh, like a line in the story that justified Andrew Scott's age, that would have helped. And I just think the casting of Freddie was was poor. I think it was a poor decision. Um, the actor was okay, but I think there are a lot of other actors that could have done a better job. And it just it was a distracting distraction for me. Um, so, especially in a piece set in the sixties, you know what I mean? Where there's an autopsy scene with that character, you know? So, um, anyway, all right, well, let's move on. American civil wars coming out this Friday. Is anyone going? Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm going to do a live reaction video with Lord toxic. Well, it'll be our, thir our Thursday night. And that's one thing, Lance, I want to ask your opinion about this, that, you know, had this film came out 10 years ago, it would have been just another film. But boy, our man, our landscape, our society has changed so much where it's like people, I'm seeing both people saying it's too far right, it's too far left. And I just want to watch a damn movie. Like, why is everything got to be like, got to be political? It's just a movie about a civil war. It's, uh, it's I don't know. Um, I mean, it, it kind of, the last time you had a film a bit like that, and I say a bit, um, was Chuck Norris Invasion USA. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'd be great if Chuck Norris had a undisclosed cameo. <laughs> um, we yeah, talked like, about, like, remember the, the hunt came out. The hunt seemed like for some people on the internet, the, the hunt was supposed to be some like far right activist movie. And I'm like, I thought the hunt was a fantastic film, a very good parody and just a re regular film, but civil war, man, people already, you know, it just sucks that people before seeing this film, they already have a certain bias walking in. Me and Lord Toxic, we want we want to go into this film, just have an open mind. I'm not sure what to expect. Is it going to be good, bad? Is it pushing left, pushing right, or is it just a movie about a civil war breaking out? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it looks like um, it looks like uh, to me, it looks like a big budget action adventure historical yeah. fiction. <clears throat> yeah, movie. It, it, plus it's got Nick Offerman as president, man. Yeah. What's like? I mean, I know you saw both private, saw both right. versions, but like, imagine a film like Red Dawn. Imagine if Red Dawn was made in twenty twenty four. Would it just be about a film about you know the Chinese invade, invading America, or would it be a big political film? I just I saw Red Dawn as just being a film about you know two warring countries, not any kind of political activism movie. Uh, don't know this person, Leroy Schveltz Butnik. Welcome to the outcast, <laughs> yeah, sir. Pleasure to you have don't. you in, in the stream. It is Alex Garland. That is absolutely correct. Who directed The Beach based on... Did he direct The Beach? No, he wrote the book The Beach. I can't remember if he directed yeah. the film version. I don't think he did. I think that was Danny Boyle. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I thought the trailer looked good. I like the idea of, yeah. um, you know, some people kind of being quite oblivious to the war and just getting on with their lives. Whereas other people are right, right. Depending on where you are, yeah. are right in the thick of it. Um, so, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. Is that, hang on a minute. Is that the actor that plays this guy in the middle? Um, Isn't that the actor that plays, um, let me see. Look up. Um, Oh fuck. Um, Narcos. Um, it looks, it does look like him, doesn't it? It looks yeah, like the guy from Narcos who plays, um, the drug, the, the drug baron. Um, um, Pablo, <laughs> Pablo Escobar. That's the, the act, that, that's the same actor, right? It, it is awesome. him. Holy shit. It's Wagner Mora. Yes. Wagner he's actually, Mora. he's a Brazilian what? actor. He played Pablo Escobar. Oh shit. He, Boy, lost, has a, he lost a few pounds. He lost a lot of weight. 
yeah. Damn, man. That guy is that guy that guy deserves to be in more stuff. Wow. He's so good. Excellent. I did not recognize him right now. Holy shit. I don't mind if it's a silly concept. I just all I care about is is it entertaining. I, I, I don't need realism. I'm I'm quite happy to have a very historical fictional yeah. You know, maybe it could happen in America a bit further out west. That's We're gonna problem. show you. That's a problem. I see, that's a life. problem I see right now. Is like, especially because this is this is election year, boy, and so many people. There's YouTube channels created to about like, you know, is it is this going to happen in 2024? And I'm like, guys, I just want to see a damn Civil War movie. <laughs> yeah, Kirsten, Kirsten Dunson. Yeah, uh, Pablo Escobar and uh, Ron Swanson. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Nick Offerman as the president. You know, I'm all in for that. Is he going to yeah. have a barbecue? <laughs> scene i think you should have a barbecue scene where he roasts meat well there's that line in the trailer and that's like that's right there are already controversial where the guy asked uh, jesse plemons is like okay so what kind of american are you and people of course yeah. on the people on twitter and tiktok take that the wrong way because in in our terms it comes down to okay that means you're either a trump or biden supporter and i'm like no this is a fictional movie this isn't happening right now right there yeah yep it's like do you do you own a color of that, do you own a version of those glasses? Because I feel when we do next week's Nielsen rating, I will. I'll you buy, should be wearing. You know, what? I'll buy some this week. <laughs> you should. You should buy some of those, and you should dye your hair blonde. Yeah, and then you can do your Jesse Plemons impression. Well, as we said, Lord Toxic, it's kind of creepy how he looks like 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 uh, Lord Toxic's younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> he has lost some weight as well there uh, because he was looking pretty Plemons. chunky in that last uh, Breaking Bad spinoff movie, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. Damn well, I always, man. I always call him Fat Matt Damon. <laughs> um, so, and Kirsten Dunn's man, she's starting to get uh, starting to get up there in age too, man. She's pushing. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not a good picture of her. <laughs> you know, wow. you know, I'll disagree with Toxic. I don't think she looks the worst. I've seen, I've seen worse, to be honest. I think this actor who was in Dune, like, Thurfer in June. Yeah, I think he. I seem to recall that there was a. He was on the Oscars in memoriam. I might be wrong, but uh, Stephen McKinley. Yeah, I think he's. Okay. I think he was. Enzo would be moaning at me at this point. Um, no, a... uh, Courtney, he's still alive. West. Oh, good. Okay, well, I'm relieved. That's nice <laughs> to know. Um, I think it might just, just have been his twin brother then. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Fat Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> Fat Damon. <Yeah. laughs> That's not Fat Matt Damon, of course. Um, Fart Damon. <laughs> Fart Damon. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, we will we will see yeah. what happens. Uh, but yeah. I am very interested to see this. Yeah, it comes out said two days from now, so I'm looking forward to uh, discussing it. I'm. I just. I have no opinion walking into this film. I just want to be as as neutral as possible. So. Do we know where it was shot? It does look like it's got some like epic yeah. well, battle out. scenes. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm wondering if it was all Atlanta again. Um, yeah, Atlanta and Pinewood Studios, isn't that? Um, You're right. Yeah. Oh, hang on, that's Captain America: Civil War. Wow, and Wes, I know this as well. So you know, A24 has been known for being a low budget studio making low budget films. To date, this is A24's most expensive film. Well, yeah, it looks like it looks it. I did not know that. What so a budget of 50 million, and again, for A24, that's that's a high budget. Here we go. Principal photography began in Atlanta March 15th, 2022. By May, production moved to London, probably post production. I'm guessing, yeah. Um, that's that's really interesting. Um, Alex Garland says he's stepping back from directing after this. I guess it was uh, took a toll then, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of juiced up to see it. Well, because Lance, we talked about not too long ago. Imagine a film like American History X being filmed in 2024. That would be a lot different mm. of a film, and that's why it's like Civil War. This film ten years ago, it would just been just another movie, but now, yeah, oh boy, <laughs> yeah, I think, and uh, you know. When it's out, I think someone should do a cut. They should do an edit of this film, but they should cut in all the Chuck Norris stuff from Invasion USA and uh, make a super mega action film with Chuck Norris. 
in the, in the midst of the Civil War, saving the day. That's definitely a film I want to see. Um, Jesse Plemons gives me Philip Seymour Hoffman vibes. Yeah, I know what you mean about that. He's, I mean, Plemons is a really good actor. I, I, I think he's he's as good as as thin Matt Damon, if not better. I have to say. Um, all right, well let's um, let's move on. We're looking forward to Civil War. Are you going to go and see it, Northern? Yeah, I might uh, sail the seven seas for it. Who knows? I might no, go see it. I get free time. Could be the setup for a north and south uh, British, uh, you know, action picture. Okay, so let's talk about Monkey Man. I have seen the trailer for this. Um, and it's funny because we were talking about um, Charl Charlotte um, Copley just the other day, and people were saying, oh, you don't see him in much now. Well, here he is. He's got a big role in this. Um, so, Blue, should we go and see Monkey Man? I think it's, uh, I would hold off until rental. I, the third act is fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Great ringtone. I would say that the first two acts are kind of, um, kind of disjarring. One thing I don't like, and Lance, I'm sure, you know, you know this as, as, uh, watching action films, the first two acts have too much jumpy cam. I hate like the whole jumpy cam, like with actions like this and you're like, what the hell is happening? And especially there's um, a good chase scene in Act 2 where it's like it shows him driving the cops and driving the cops. And like it's just a quick like this. Like the, the scene's going so fast. I'm watching my kid and we're like, wow, it's like way too much. It's the action shouldn't be that over the top, like, you know, crazy. But the third act is really good. But considering this is his first uh, his first uh, directorial debut, he also acted in a film. He wrote the screenplay, the screenplay produced it. It's a very good first film. I would wait till a rental. It's for the most part, it's like a Hindu, a Indian version of John Wick. And I hate to say that, but like, you know, John Wick set the bar, guys. And you're watching this film, and you're thinking you're seeing so many John Wick references because John Wick is just the the action stamp or the action, I guess, uh, goalpost we set ourselves to right now. It's a it's a decent film. I think um, this director has uh, a lot of improving to do, but not a bad film by any means. So I I think it's worth a rental. But I wouldn't rush out to see it right now. Yeah. Guys, I'll be right with you. I'll be right with you. Keep keep carrying on talking, uh, Blue. Uh, I mean, I do like the fact that like this character. I mean, it's like the first John Wick film is simple. Uh, his wife dies. They kill his puppy. He's on revenge. This is a pretty thin plot. Uh, the main character he dresses like a monkey <laughs> during cage fighting, constantly getting his ass kicked. Uh, the big bad guy killed his mother. It's another simple revenge tale. He's going on a tale for revenge because his mother died. That's pretty much it. It's a very thin plot and. He does get better. I give them credit. The action scenes do get better as the film progresses. But the first and second act, I didn't like how disjarring the action was. And that was my main criticism with the Bourne films is Matt Damon had too much of the shaky cam. It's like, and that was with the Taken films. Like, I remember when Honest Trailers came out, they did that joke with Taken 3 where like Liam Neeson jumped over the fence and he showed 30 cuts. For Liam Neeson jump over a fence, it was like cut, 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 like, holy shit, man. You know, John Wick 4, for whatever problems you may have with the plot, you actually could see Keanu doing these action scenes. And like Luke, you know this, The Matrix, you've seen these big wide shots with Keanu fighting Lawrence Fishburne, and they were just going at it left and right. The whole like shaky cam, constantly going like this with fighting, that's really fucking disjarring. And it feels like the actors don't know what they're doing. But the third act, the last 15 minutes is very well choreographed. So I would recommend seeing it when it comes to home video. But, you know, it's... If you compare us to John Wick, John Wick is just a superior film. It's a it's a decent action film, but I give him props for being a first time director. Okay, um, apologies for my phone going off there, people watching. Uh, it's always entertaining because it's such a comical ringtone. Um, but I should I should always remember to put it on uh, vibrate, and I thought I had. Um, <coughs> I could tell you about that call, but uh, I will do. But when we're not live, entertaining. No, it doesn't, Drew. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> for all all it's worth, man. whatever it's where Jordan Peele did produce it, and said it's a pretty, you know, it's a decent, it's an okay film, you know. So I, I, it's worth it's worth a watch, you know. So did Dev Patel direct it? He directed it. He acts in it. He produced it. He wrote the screenplay. He wrote the story. It's like this is his movie. It may say Jordan Peele produced it, but this is Dev Patel's film. That's why I was like, I give him credit, you know. It's like it's 
for his first film, it's pretty good for a first time director. Darth Plato says, sounds like RRR meets Rocky. Oh, uh, yeah, you know. I said I just I didn't like I didn't I did not like the fight scenes and the action in the first two acts, but the it feels like the third act was different cinematographers, but the third act, the third act is fantastic. But you know, for me to tell you that one act I liked, but I didn't like the first two acts, the first two acts are kind of disjarring. So I'm like, but the third act is so fantastic, it kind of like it feels like almost he had help directing the, the third act versus the first two acts, you know what I mean? Hmm. Okay. Well, what would you give it out of ten? Um, I'd say five, you know. Oh, okay. But but um, it, it's me saying though. But I I really want to see more. I think he has nothing but improvements. I want to see more from him. I think if this this is his first film, he can only go up from here. I think he's got a lot of potential to hit like a a, a higher echelon of directing. So would you say it's a good debut? Honestly, yes, I would. I just like okay. when you watch it, said the first two acts are kind of disjarring. Take if, if if the entire film was the third act, I'd give it like a nine out of ten. But the, the first two acts are a lot different than the third act. That's what I didn't like about it. It's like this reminds me of a poster for a James Bond film. It's like Bond in the middle yeah. with all the ladies. Um, yeah. Although, you know, I'm not sure if all of them are ladies, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, there's a nice camera rig. Um, Blood sport rather than Rocky. <laughs> Who's the chick? Good question. Um, yeah. So Monkey Man. Okay, well, that's out in the US now. I'm not yeah. sure if it's out in the UK um, at the present time. You also saw um, the One Night with the Devil, is it called? Late Night with the Devil. Late Night with the Devil. Dave Dismortion. Oh, what, what yeah. a, oh my God, I'm so happy. I have been Wait. fortunate enough to meet. Which of course the the, the uh, Gord King himself wrote me on Twitter and he's like, "Hey, how'd you like it, dude?" I'm like, "Gord King." He he's like, uh, "Chris, go see this film." And the Pumpkin Man got a good taste in the films. Yeah, I did love and let you know this. The whole they purposely filmed it with the four three aspect ratio and seeing it in four three and a big screen was just so it fit the tone of the film and and the film grain. It felt like watching a seventies like a nineteen seventies you know um. A late night show. The music, the tone, the film grain was so on point. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe how great how great the, the cinematography was. Yeah, I saw the trailer for it with um the last movie I went to see at the cinema. God, what was that? God, it must have been that memorable. Oh yeah, June, 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 yeah. June part two. Uh trailered this. Uh, and I love that poster. I think that's a great poster, that. Yeah. Um <coughs> And um, what's the basic premise of the film without giving too much away? Um, basically, the devil hosts a late night sort of well, it's like that show type thing. He plays a character where he's um he's second place to Johnny Carson. He's trying to hit that you know that late night talk show number one spot, and nothing's working. And of course, he comes to find out that um perhaps there's a girl possessed by the devil. And like in the court, it's the 70s. Yeah, right. You know, possession is BS. And Maybe she actually is possessed by a devil. Because, <laughs> you know, back in the 70s, oh, it's just a talk show gimmick. It's 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 false. And he has a psychic right there. The psychic's like, I can read into the mind of the audience, you know, and I, I can speak into the spirit world. Everyone's like, yeah, right, you know. But it, it is. So he's trying everything he can to boost his ratings to beat Johnny Carson. You know, it's like the, the whole late night wars. He wants to be number one. And he will do anything he can to be number one with, as late night and that's pretty so much what, it. So what would yeah. you what would you give it out of ten? Uh definitely a boy. I go with a nine. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, because it, it does it, like I said, it's this the shot here, the four three aspect ratio, but the music, the vibe, the tone, the laughter, it feels like you're watching a 70s late night movie. And it's, it's so good. I mean, I've talked about um David Dow Matchian on my channel before. Um I, he was already on my radar before he was in June. I met him briefly at the premiere. I'd already written to him before I knew he was even in June. I'd had correspondence with him on email because he had supported a lot of independent films and somebody yeah. said, you should talk to him. Unfortunately, uh, he's too big for me now. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he's, his career is just going to explode after yeah. this. And I keep saying, I understand actors, it's their job to, to uh, memorize long lines of dialogue. But, man, some, like some scenes he has I'm like how do you remember like that many words in one sentence and but you can tell 
he grew up with that kind of genre where it's like he feels like this guy could be in the days of Johnny Carson and you know, like um uh David Letterman, and he feels like just everything feels like a seven it's just how authentic it feels to be a 70s late night talk show. It's like, man, he, the way he plays it, like you know this, Lance. This guy, he does not he's not typecast, he doesn't play the same character in every single film. No, if, if you watch his other films, it doesn't feel like this is Dave Desmolchin. This guy plays like a Johnny Carson ripoff in a sense, and he's trying so hard to, to be number one, and he can't. Like, there's something something missing there, you know? One thing, I, well, the, one of the first things I saw him in uh, was this single season show where he, he's in a gang of greasers, and it, he's in it a lot, but he's hardly got any dialogue. And I remember saying to my then partner when we were watching it, I said, so this guy, you, when you put him in a scene, you can't take your eyes off him. You know, yeah. he's so good. And um, I'm not surprised. It probably wasn't a big dialogue part, but they, they know what they've got with him. So they're, they're giving yeah. him lots of screen time, you know. Yeah. Um, Northern, have you seen it yet? No, I keep, I keep forgetting to get around to it. We'll have to try and get around to watching it before... Maybe on Saturday. So <laughs> yeah, really good. I, I like this actor, and yeah. it sounds batshit insane, and uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, plus there's a pumpkin. Look, there's Gord King in the background. <laughs> um, oh, dude. Yeah, we did talk about Lance for uh, for Luke and Enzo. Is that this will be coming to Shutter next week? So if you want to get a quick Shutter, Shutter subscription for five bucks, it's coming right on Shutter. They're you know, they're the first service to get this film right to streaming services. Okay, I may so. check that out. I mean, I might go and see it at the cinema. Yeah, if you can. I definitely want to see American Civil War. Uh, American Civil War. I definitely <laughs> want to see Civil War, which happens to be set in America, on the biggest screen I can because it just looks like a big budget, fun, yeah, action movie. Um, so, um, I mean, uh, in terms of real life, I found David very, very personable um, and yeah. quite a reserved guy. Yeah, it's officially it's April nineteenth. It'll be on Shutter. So, so ten days mm -hmm. from now. Look forward to seeing it. I love these color schemes. That is so 70s. And the smart thing, too, is when they show, like, when they're off camera, it's in black and white. So go back to black and white color, black and white color. And it's, it's supposed to be the whole, like, this is, uh, according to the film, oh, the narration, the first 10 minutes is narrated by um, I can't, Michael Ironside. I was, like, I, reckon, I was like, who's that voice of Michael Ironside? I looked it up. Michael Ironside narrates, like, this is the found footage of this incident that happened back in 1975 with this late night talk show host. And oh, so is it all played like the actual footage from the show from yes. the seventh? Oh, nice. Yes. Okay. That's what's it. And then that's it. And then when when like when, when they go offline, when because they say like the whole like you know one second, uh, one second for our commercial break, and then he's offline. Like, what's really happening? Because of course the girl she's being possessed, and everyone's like, "Is this for real?" And like, no, this is. Oh, it's just part of the act. And like now you're seeing the black and white footage where it's like. No, this is real. She's like, she's like floating above the audience and stuff, and her head's spinning around and puking out green blood. And <laughs> everyone's like, Oh, this is part of the show. And everyone's like, This isn't part of the show, guys. Like, <laughs> damn. Yeah. Well, we shall, uh, we shall see what we, sh we shall see what happens. Yeah, highly recommend it. Um, so, uh, let's move on. Uh, you also saw the first so you're, film, do, yeah. you're doing the Enzo job this week. You, oh, yeah. You've seen like 50 films. <laughs> you also first. saw the new Omen prequel. Yeah. Boy. How is that? It was fantastic. I mean, the first I, Omen, in fact, yeah. is cool. I, I truly think you could you could watch this film and, and watch right and go right into the um the first Omen film and it would just transition very nicely. And it was actually directed by a woman and lots of uh lots of body horror. And it's uh, there's a couple of scenes where I'm like, I was looking at the screen like, wow, these uh, these guys went there. Okay, sure, <laughs> it's definitely a horror film by all accounts. So it's directed by uh, Akasha Stevenson. She directed one episode of Legion, one episode of Briar Patch, brand new cherry flavor. These are not shows I've seen. I am familiar with them. Yeah, and and some shorts. So this looks like her first. Yeah, this is her first feature film. Hey, it's good on her then. She uh she deserved it. <laughs> um let's uh get some stills up. So yeah, what but, I mean well, is, the this the, is this the like the Gregory Peck family 
trying to have a baby is is that the premise it's, or? it's a basic premise where well everyone well I'm sure people know the omen the premise is damien being born and this is the prequel where she's the, the main character is in an orphanage and these um people keep having uh you know the, the omen is coming out there and they keep having all these different pregnancies but the problem is to keep birthing women and girls and girls and girls but everyone knows that the prophecy is gotta be born damien damien's the omen not a female so ralph not, ralph, ralph innocent is in it from the office yeah, yeah. he's a priest in the movie. He's I'm this, gonna, I'm gonna lay money down that he does not survive until the final reel. He's got this voice about him and this, like, you know, <laughs> talking right now to David and the Catholic Church and this very Scottish accent. And I can't do a voice like that, but that man's got some range. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. got, he's yeah. got a very northern. Uh, yes. Voice, yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah, there's, 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 in the office as well. He's very he's northern. Very there's rumors that he might be uh, bastard. Might be his love child. <laughs> <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I aspire to get a voice that day. Oh my god, yeah, I can. Sonia that. Bragger, I used to, I used to fancy her back in yeah. the day. Uh, Charles, not sure, not sure the nun outfit's working for me. But. Charles Dance is in the film for. Uh, he's in the film. We'll say that. <laughs> Charles for, Dance for all of two minutes and a hefty paycheck. Yeah. Oh, Bill Nye's Bill Nye. in it. First thing my kid says, Dad, who's that? Mike, you know what that is? He's like, Dad, who's that? Mike, that's 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 Davy Jones, buddy. That's that's Victor from Underworld. He goes, Oh my god, and like, yeah. Bill Nye, just oh, Bill Nye is always good. Oh yeah, yeah. Nell Tiger Free. Now that's a very interesting name. Mm. I feel we have to find out more yeah. in a second. Well, look, there's uh, Bill doing his classic <laughs> pose. So now, what what else have I seen Nell Tiger Free in? Hmm. Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Nice. I, I I do remember her from that, even though she only had a, a small part. <laughs> Um, yeah, one of the Baratheon ladies. Um, so I'm guessing this yeah. is, yeah, she was in Broken. Okay. Um, pretty big role for her then. She's one of the main characters in it, I'm guessing. Yeah. She's in a good, uh, boy, like I'd, I'd say like 90% of the movie. So it's, you have to she have She lives a... in Britain with her parents and her older yeah. sister <laughs> who wrote that biography, her mum. <laughs> You know, no one no one cares about that stuff. <laughs> um, who else we got in the cast here? This says Charles Dance. Just I uh, don't reckon it recognize any of the smaller names, but so yeah. what would you what would you what would you give the first God. omen? Um eight, I'll say eight out of ten. It's uh say really, really good. I remember the third power Darth. That's an old movie if it's the one I'm thinking <laughs> of. Finchy. Yeah, so yeah. Hundred percent. Like it makes me uh, sit when it comes out on DVD. I actually do want to watch or digital watch this and you know, right into the first <coughs> moment the film. I want to see the transition. But I, you know, it's been a while since I watched it. But I do think this does homage to that Omen franchise. Yeah. Um, and you saw um, yet another movie. Yeah, that said the 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 twenty fifth anniversary of the Matrix. Oh and yeah, yeah, yeah! At the cinema. Cool. Yeah, but of course it was announced by Incredible Drink retweeted it that they're working on officially a fifth Matrix film. You know what, guys? Oh, listen, oh. after seeing after seeing the first Omen, I'm Get just in your I'm head, a, man. I, I'm, your a, head. I'm a stupid optimistic. Like I want to see franchises be saved. I'm like, please, please, someone save the Matrix. Come on. <laughs> no. It's just, man. It's just. Come on. It's 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 uh, it's beyond saving, man. I know. They they fucked it up too badly. I keep telling myself that we can save anything, Lance. Come on, we have to keep trying. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, but that, that first film is just, it's so, again, not, not having seen this film in 20 years, watching it in a the theater, just, oh my God, such the, if, if anyone said that the first Matrix is, is in their top 10 of all time, I couldn't fight you. It's such a great movie on so many levels. Hmm. Okay, uh, Northern, uh, in between sleeping and resting, uh, <laughs> what, what have you Northern. seen? Well, uh, I have just boozing. watched uh, Stand By Me. Ah, uh, oh, such a good movie. Uh, High Fidelity, which I've uh, seen, watched for the first time. and I'd like to see that remade and set in the UK as the original yeah. book. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the, the guy, Nick Hornby, is a British uh, writer and he mostly it's writes set in, It's set in Crouch End, 500 metres that way from my flat. It was still I pretty even, I even know the score he kind of based it on. Yeah. 
And uh, last was uh, was the John Favreau and Vince Vaughn classic Swingers, which I'd not seen in a long time. And man, that that phone call sequence. Yeah, we've been there. We've all been there. <laughs> man, that that was just like when you're watching that in the cinema. Oh my god, it's painful. Yeah, we all, have a, we all have a friend like Vince Vaughn. He's, he's kind of the life at the party, but at the same time, he's kind of his own worst enemy as well. It's like, uh, if the, if the, if no one's giving us any attention, this place is dead. Let's go somewhere else. It's like, <laughs> yeah. God, I love it. It makes you want to go out and get drunk with your mates. It's, one of those, it's just a great film with great dialogue. It's very funny. It's very real. And uh, it's, oh God, it's, it's just brilliant. We need, we need more films like that again, you know, films where we're seeing men act like men. Acts like men going out, trying to fucking get laid. It's uh, We don't, we barely get that anymore. Well, I, I liked, um, I mean, I, I like the homages they did to Goodfellas, where they're going into yeah. the secret entrance to the, the jazz club. And then they also do that homage to... Um, Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> yeah, and um, I like how, uh, how most of the time the, the clubs are packed in so tight that their their arms are sticking up like the little T Rexes because they're trying to fucking move yeah. around. And they, uh, yeah, been there, been there. It's uh, that's totally accurate. Back in the that's days when cool. John Favreau was a slim guy. Yeah, um, it was. Man. The, the dude was like a bloody Ken doll back then. He, this yeah. also launched the career of. Ron Livingston. It was one of Vince Vaughn's first films. I don't think it was his first. Um, I always thought... Um, Vince Vaughn had been uh, in a Psycho remake as well, only before this, I think. I always thought Alex... Um, I don't know if that's Alex Dessert. Do you say that? Alex Dessert? What a name. No, that's... that's Okay, that's the wrong actor. Uh, Patrick Van Horn, um, who played... I forget the name of his character in Swingers. Um, but he's the one who pulls the gun out. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. He Loses his his shit. His I always thought he was, I really rated him in the film. I always thought he was a cracking actor. He's only got 15 acting credits. I think he, I think he was, because you know that film was shot for $75,000. This is pre-digital. They got a load of discarded film stock, borrowed some cameras. And that's why there's lots of long single takes. In the movie, there's not like loads of multiple cuts, and um, it's basically about two best friends who are single. They're not trying to make it as actors in LA. One night they go to Vegas for the night, but they also hang out in these kind of speakeasy clubs in LA. And um, <clears throat> the swingers doesn't refer to swingers parties in the title, in case anyone's wondering. Um, but it's uh, more about that they're swinging kind of guys, but it's also about the music, which is kind of a nod to swing music. It's got that kind of vibe. So, um, yeah, young Heather Graham in the movie. Uh, and it's directed yeah. by Doug Lyman, who did, um, a, was it, what's the Tom Cruise Born one, Live by Repeat? Yeah, he did The Born Identity. Yeah, I think he did the uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Jesus. Edge of Tomorrow, yeah, used the original title, which is a lot better. But this um, is this is almost autobiographical because these actors were struggling. Like uh, jo yeah. John Favreau had his big break with Rudy, but then he wasn't working no more. So far, this did this was. Um, I think this was Doug Lyman's first film. I think. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's it's. I mean, it's laugh out loud funny. It's got some absolute brilliant moments in it. I love it. This is the line where he goes. Haven't you seen Boys from the Hood? Now one of us is going to get shot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the dialogue just, is great. It, it what are you just, talking? It feels real as well. It doesn't feel like, like uh, yeah. He, he's like he's like talking like he's some black gangster. He's going, "What are you doing carrying a guy? What do you mean we kept our rep, bro? You know, you, listen. It's not like why are you carrying a gun? It's not like you live in Compton where there's bullets whizzing by." You know, I live in a bad neighbourhood, and he's like, "You live in nine hundred two and What are you talking about? It's, it's just, <laughs> it is nuts." And then they they make up with those guys, and they're all playing video games around their house later. <laughs> yeah, which is you know pretty fun. 
these actors are just that they've got such amazing chemistry in this film. Have you seen it, Blue? Have you seen this movie? Ah, uh, no, I can't think of it. Sorry, <laughs> dude, you've got to watch it. This yeah, is we need to all those as we. Oh god, it's, it's a really short film, and it's a perfect like beer and pizzas I mean, movie. I'm sold then. Hey, <laughs> and um. Yeah, I mean the answer phone scene, man, will just it will make you cross your legs, honestly. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, it's like the fourth time he rings and saying, uh, I think uh your answer, your answer machine clicks but before I put it down, but never mind, never mind. It's Mike, by yeah. the way. It's, <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> Dan Candy, lance your money. You're so money and you don't even know it. Yeah, thanks, oh, man. Who's the winner, Dan? Who's the winner? Big Dan, big Dan's the winner. Underrated, yeah, like, underrated quote is, ah, uh, oh, this place is dead anyway. Because <laughs> yeah, that's what they say a lot. Anytime they go into a place where it's supposed to be, this big place where they're going to get laid, it's dead anyway. Because they aren't getting uh, as many girls as they want. I love that line where he goes, they're at that party up in the hills. And it's some kind of industry party. They don't really know whose it is. And everybody's there is like grift, grafting, grifting, you know. And they end up talking to some girl or whatever. And um, yeah, the Jaws music plays as well. He's like, he's waiting for it to give her the Jaws he, music. Yeah, dun, 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 dun. Number, number man, just so he can get the fuck out of there and tear it off. <laughs> and then, um, the, the, then uh, Favreau's got that line What am I supposed to be impressed because she's wearing a backpack? <laughs> you know, when all the girls used to wear those little backpacks instead of carrying purses. Do you remember that? Little tiny black packs yeah. that was very, very late 90s. <laughs> yeah, really. I love this movie. I'll give it a nine out of ten. I I, I owned it on VHS. Yes, Same. <laughs> I've seen it so yeah. many times. Oh, this scene is so funny. Yeah, he thinks uh, his mate's getting laid, and then it turns out he's just uh, talking to her about uh, how heartbroken he is about his woman, and uh, he just completely cock blocks him. Funnily <laughs> enough, if that's Catherine Kendall in that scene, I think she was in. The sequel to Fletch, but I might be wrong about that. Wow. Oh man, you know she's still acting. Twenty twenty three, got lots of credit. You know what? We need to try and get her on. If that's the latest. If that's her latest photo, then she's still looking good. Well, it wasn't just for that reason, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I just think she'd be oh, really nice. interesting. Oh, we'll get thing. Thing. Who knows? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, she'd be great to go on. I, I'm going to see if I can track her down, and she's a producer now as well. So, if it's for um, a Jewel of Fallen Swingers, count me in. Uh, Northern, what else have you seen apart from films about swingers this week? Oh yeah, there was uh, Stand by Me, which is which is just a bloody classic. It really is. Uh, River Phoenix, Corey <laughs> Feldman. Uh, well, I think um, I might do a special about that. So. I won't dive into detail with that on that now, but you're right. Yeah, it's classic movie, amazing movie. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very good film about uh, how hard it is being a kid in the fifties, and uh, yeah, kids these days are spoiled. Mm. What's Stand by Me and fucking get a sense of how people used to live? Uh, and that's when candy tasted really <laughs> good before they <laughs> fucked it up with all those. I always said, Lance, my father, I I was never allowed to cross train tracks for a good like six years of my life. <laughs> To that movie, <laughs> you know, I'll cross train tracks. Oh yeah, I mean, I was terrified. My my, my dad instilled that into me after that, that film. I never went anywhere near train tracks for until I was like eighteen. <laughs> uh, there were two. I've never I've never run across one of those. We don't have them here. You're not allowed to get on train tracks in the UK. We have some we... here in near our house. I was like, never knew. <laughs> um, I saw two documentaries. Both on Netflix. One is a three-parter, both crime documentaries. One is a one-off single movie. One was good. One was a bit rubbish. Um, the fairly decent one was the anti-social network. Yeah. Uh, this is about the the early hackers who some of whom became anonymous. For anyone who doesn't know who Anonymous are, <coughs> you don't want to get on their bad side. But generally, they were doing quite quite good things. They were they were going after people in a Robin Hood style who were ripping people off and um, 
hacking their networks. There's a lot of people that do that on YouTube now who hack um, call centers, scammer call centers in Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and they tap into their cameras. Have, have you guys seen any of those videos? No. Oh, guys, you've got to watch those. They are, they're they priceless, man. At one point, this this American guy is, is great at it. I mean, several people, are, that, that's their YouTube channel, and they're really good at doing it. Wow. One of them hacks into this. <coughs> um, um, he takes a call, and he's got a voice disguiser, and he pretends to be an old lady. And the woman is just being abusive to him, um, but thinking he's the old lady. Yeah. And attempts to, you know, get her account numbers and, of course, steal all her money, which is what they do. And then um, what's what's brilliant um, is uh, as soon as she thinks uh, she's hacked, it's the other way around. Uh, he's actually hacked their computer. He's gone into her computer. He's got all her personal information, where she lives, um, her photographs, all her photographs from her Instagram. And um, wow. then he reveals who he is and he says, you know, you're about to scam me. Now I'm going to release all your personal information onto the Internet. And they're begging him Damn. not to not to do it. And her boyfriend comes on the line and they're both like begging, begging him not to release it. I've got no sympathy for these people whatsoever because they were about to steal a load of money from an old woman. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot like that. But um the anti-social network is more about kind of how um, things like um, Reddit and <coughs> all of that stuff started being used by people that were politically active, um, how it initially it was kind of fun and then it turned into something else. Yeah. Several people have been interviewed on it, including people who have been um, sent to prison. It's pretty interesting. It's a pretty good one-off documentary. It covered a lot of stuff that I wasn't really aware of. I quite liked it. That's why Lance, um, you know, I always said that's why Yumi said for uh, for Beekeeper, with Jason Statham, we have yeah. certain, we have a certain soft spot for that film because like, that happens so much in real life. And Beekeeper, it said critically in, in box office, everyone went to go see it because how many people get pissed off that their their mothers or grandmothers get ruined by these people? You know, it happens a lot. Yeah. Um, Jay Goodwin's right. This documentary certainly focuses a big chunk of time on yeah. 4chan and 8chan, which was like a cluster of hackers, a cluster of programmers um, who were this sort of loose-knit group of guys. And when they did their first public appearance, they couldn't believe one of them was practically like a 15-year-old kid, which was hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know... <clears throat> but uh it's yeah it's worth watching it's kind of interesting um the other one that i saw which was i thought it could have been a lot better than it was and i think it was because they uh but it's a it's it's crime scene berlin it's a it's a three-parter um it's basically a true story it's a documentary it's not a drama uh about this guy who for reasons that are never in my opinion really I don't think they delved into, and maybe there isn't an answer there, but they didn't really cover this guy's background enough for me, which is why I felt the series was a bit, ultimately it kind of failed. Yeah. But the loose story is a guy was going around the gay scene in Berlin and he was overdosing people with GHB and then robbing them. And um, <clears throat> there's two people that went to prison in London, I think it was two Brazilians for doing that over here. And they accidentally killed one guy and they went back to his flat several times and were just stripping his flat of all yeah. his shit. And they yeah. got caught. They went to prison. This guy was actually doing it deliberately to kill people Damn. Uh, as well as stealing the stuff from them. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's not bad. Um, <coughs> And Jay says that he thought it was good. It's certainly not bad. It's, it's you know, if you're into true crime um, or you just want to find out more about, you know, Berlin's gay scene, this could be the crime documentary for you. Um, the thing that was missing for me was we know that this guy had a partner in real life. 
And I guess the partner didn't really want to be interviewed, but we didn't yeah. find out anything else about his domestic situation other than he had a partner. Yeah. You know, was he a kept man? Uh, what other things did him and his partner do together? How is it this guy was on his own for prolonged periods of time where he went and committed those crimes? I just felt that there was a lot that was missing, but there were a lot of interviews, very heartfelt interviews with the relatives of the poor young men that died and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, he was classed as a serial killer because he killed, um, I think, three or four, I think it was three people and nearly killed a fourth person. He drugged one guy on a train. Wow. Like, he was travelling into Berlin with him. Talk about ballsy. Gave him a um, a miniature, you know. Yeah. <coughs> and, and then had to carry him um, and left him in the street, I think. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but it's not bad. The other thing I saw was Scoop. Who's seen Scoop? Scoop. Huh. Also on Netflix. I One heard about this because Julian Anderson's in it. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard of that. Yeah, mate. Actually, yeah, I think I have been um, hearing about this with Prince Andrew, is not it? <laughs> yeah, Luke, I was beginning to think you were taking a nap. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is about the, the interview with Prince Andrew. It's about how it came about. Um, who 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 managed to get the scoop, so to speak. Um, and that story is quite interesting. I personally didn't think they needed to recreate the interview with Rufus Saul playing Andrew, although he is very, very good. Huh. So, th so they're, they're basically just recreating an existing interview? <coughs> I would say that um, the film is about 90 minutes long. 60 minutes of it is how they managed to get him to do the interview. Okay. And the various people around him who thought that that was a good idea. Yeah. And the remaining 30 minutes is the interview itself and so on. Um, I mean, you can see the interview. It's out there. It's on YouTube and stuff. Because the interview was considered to be a car crash. It's the one where wow. he's denying knowing the girl that he met at um, Jeffrey Epstein's apartment in New York. Oh. Yeah. Um, and... Um, who the girl who claims she had sex with Andrew three times, I think. Um, and um, so this is all Dan Candy's asking. This is all to do with the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Boy. Uh, Prince Andrew is known to have spent time on his island. He's known to have spent time at his and just Lane's Maxwell's apartment, uh, or yeah. not apartment, their um, townhouse, brown, massive yeah. brownstone. In, um, and it's, it's good. Um, really well acted. Huh. This is the interview where he claims he can't sweat. That's correct. Wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, it's 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 good. I mean, Rufus Saul is almost unrecognisable as Prince Andrew. Huh. You've got Billy Piper, who most people will know from Doctor Who, and uh, Keely Hawes and Gillian Anderson, of course. Um, who plays the lady doing the interview. Yeah, it's good. I liked it. A um, lot of, lot of goods. Lot, uh, and I've got two friends in it. Um, one of my um, uh, friend's son, who I knew when he was just a little boy, is in this, is in this show. I don't think there'll be a picture of him on here. There is Rufus Saul playing mm. Prince Andrew, camouflaged um. under makeup. Yeah, he, he you wouldn't think that was the same actor. I mean, because this guy, yeah, actually, yeah. Um, my friend's son plays one of the people on this production team, but he's not in that shot. And then I have another friend who's playing one of Andrew's advisors, um, Tim, who was interviewed on the Outcast Creative, and you can see an interview with him. But he didn't talk about this, even though he had filmed it then, because he was under NDA until it came out, so he wasn't allowed to talk about it. Um, yeah, it is good. Keely Hawes is very good in this as well. Um, and I haven't seen her have a a role this meaty uh, for a while, so it was good to see her. And Billy Piper's very good in it. She was quite, quite, quite a surprise. Gillian Anderson's always great. Yeah, I think she lives over here now, and I think she's making a bit of a niche in England. She's done a lot of plays here. She's doing a lot of British roles because she played Margaret Thatcher, of course, in The Crown as well. Hmm. And um, I think she's 
I think we, we've stolen her from you. <laughs> I, no, she, I, I didn't know. She, I didn't know she was British. Though, I, uh, for a long no, time. She's, she's not British. She's not. That's why I'm she saying is, we've uh, stolen her. Traitor. <laughs> I, at least I don't think she was originally English. I think she might be. She might be Canadian rather than American. But either way, we've nicked her. We're well, not having her back now. She, she, no, she's an American actress. She's American. I just checked. Huh. Um, and she's been. Oh, she was partners with Peter Morgan for 2016 to 2020. Creator of The Crown, writer and creator of The Crown. Hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, she's 55 years old and still looks uh, still looks great for her age. Too. That's amazing. Yeah, she does. Um, I'm 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 glad she's over here. And um, I hmm. didn't get to see her on stage, sadly. Her play was very very sold out. Um, but I recommend Scoop. Scoop, I would say is. An eight and a half out of ten. Melvin was sure she was English. Yeah, her English <laughs> accent is amazing. Yeah. She does do a great, great um nice. Lost his morality glands in the war. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why he doesn't sweat. That's why he doesn't sweat. Um <clears throat> that's all the stuff I've got that I've seen. Um, has anybody got anything else they want to recommend? I did finish Lance. I purposely watched one episode a day, not to binge it, but um, I heard things about episode t or sorry, season ten of the Blacklist hit Netflix. I wanted to. Oh see yeah, it. that's the final season. I oh think. my god! I just like James Spader. I just oh, he just it's James Spader. He's so fantastic in this in this uh this role, and I, I wanted to just you know take one episode a day, digest it, and because you know we're saying goodbye to this character after ten seasons. But yeah, I, I was happy with it. It's like anything, you know, whenever you have a finale, you're never going to please 100% of your fans. But, you know, it's like Walter White, The Shield, and these characters. Raymond Reddington is a bad guy. It's simple as that, guys. He has one of two fates. Either spend life in prison or get killed and take that as it is. It's like with uh, with um, Brian Cranston and Walter White. He's the biggest meth dealer in the, pl in the planet. You know, either two things, get killed or life in prison. <laughs> There's not much more which can happen. <laughs> Yeah, I saw um because he's like a sort of he's an ex well he's the CIA most... agent who yeah. for reasons um that I've forgotten yeah. is number one on their wanted list. He turns yeah. himself in. Yes, that's in episode the one episode, which most is this... wanted man on the planet. He's Raymond Reddington, the, the biggest criminal on, on earth, and every government on the planet wants him. And episode one, he turns himself in. Everyone's like why the hell did number one criminal for the past 30 years just walk in like, hey, guys, I give up? And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? because, I mean, the premise of so. the show is that he's got so much incredibly valuable information yes. that they can't really afford to put him away. That's what's called. Need the, to, they need to work him as a, a source. Yes, that, that's why it's called the blacklist. He goes, listen, you think I'm bad? He goes, you know, I'm a thief. I just, I'm a criminal, no doubt. But there's people out there, and the FBI says we have our, our own most wanted list. He goes, he's like, look, I know people, I know criminals that you don't even know about that are doing things you're not even aware of. And every season he takes down these people, and you're like, you know what? And I could see this kind of stuff happening in real life. You know, I'm sure for a fact that every government has different things that. They don't tell they don't tell the public about um i have followed spader's career yeah since he said that line in pretty in pink <laughs> actually tough turf yeah. which he did before and i followed dan's him right. tough turf dan's but right he, this makes me want to go watch boston legal now but same thing blacklist he gives some some monologues and just even though he's a criminal he's the whole it's a cliche lance like you know he's a bad guy but he's a bad guy that you love because the thing is, he even though he's a bad guy, he has rules, you know. And it's the, and he starts helping, he helps the FBI take down worse bad guys. He's like, and he says it, you know. I know I'm a criminal, I'm a bad guy, but I have still, I have limits, I have my own rules, I have stipulations. And the and <coughs> Harry, Harry Lennox, Harry Lennox is fantastic. I love Harry Lennox. I only saw about three seasons. Then I kind of got sidetracked. Life, you know yeah. how it goes. No, I understand. I mean, is is this a show that I can, okay, I kind of want to see how it ends. Can I just jump from season three to season 10 or have I got to go back? Have I got I, to commit? I would, and... I would say so. You probably could. I mean, I think it doesn't hurt to watch every season, but um, yeah, it's basically like every season. It's just, he's taken down different bad guys. Simple as that. Every season has the one main bad guy that he's taken down with, with uh, the FBI task force. But the one thing I will admit that the first couple of seasons, his character and Harry Lennox, I just said, 
I have a whole new respect for Harry Lennox as an actor because him and James Spader start spending so much time together on screen where these two, they have a certain chemistry where I'm like, wow, because Harry Lennox is the head of the FBI and Raymond, Raymond Redditing is the most wanted man on the planet. So how do you deal with that? You know, but Harry Lennox, he understands the fact that, you know, we need you to take down worse people than what you are, because even though you're a criminal, you still have like uh, laws, you still have rules that you, that you have lines that you won't cross. That's what I like about this show. So he's definitely, he's the, he's the bad guy, but he's a lovable bad guy. That's what's so great about him. Yeah, so like an anti-hero as well. You know, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, we kind of want to see more people like him, you know, because yeah. more people are becoming aware of just how dodgy our government is and, uh, yeah. and uh, we want to see more guys like him take these guys down. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of like fantasy, isn't it? And, and Jay's right there. I'm sure, yeah, there is plot issues later on. I won't debate that. Just overall, I do feel like every government, not just our government, but there is there's stuff the government is doing out there that's messed up. And I love Raymond because Raymond just said he does some he does some, some shady shit, you know, but he also does a lot of good things too. As well, it's a whole thing we dealt with Michael Chiklis with the shield. Vic Mackey does some terrible stuff, but then Vic Mackey does some really nice things. And you're like, how do you hate this guy when it's like he commits five crimes, but then he solves five crimes? And you're like, man, man. <laughs> hey, he's the guy that you want in the room when yeah. someone's kidnapped your kid, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's the guy who gets his hands dirty. Well, yeah, just the simple, like, yeah. The simplified, yeah. the simplified version is Raymond Renant is a character where it's like, you know, if you want to catch a thief, you need a thief. It's simple yeah. as that. And that's yeah. what he is. But no, uh, but, but James Spader, he's just, I love James Spader. He's such a good, good actor. I, I have been meaning to go back and watch the rest of the blacklist, but it's like one of those things. It's like, oh, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm in the yeah. mood to watch an episode tonight. Yeah. That's what I said. I, I, just, I, I just did like, like it. I just watched one episode a day, and, and, and there's enough there where if you watch one a day, you can digest it over the course of like six months. I mean, it took me a month to watch because it's like 20, you're getting 23 episodes, 24 per season. So it took me a good three weeks to watch the final season. I just wanted to say goodbye to everybody, say goodbye to these actors, say goodbye to, you know, it's been 10 years. And the fact that they got 10 years, it was the number one show on NBC for like a good five, six years in a row because of Spader's. But Spader, he's why you're watching the show for. And like people said, it makes me want to go back and watch Boston Legal now because Spader just, there's something about this guy. He can deliver a monologue like nobody else. Hmm. Yeah, he's, he's he's a good actor. Yeah. I remember him when he had hair. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of good guest actors that pop up in this show as well. Throughout yes, the, a lot of them. Yeah, throughout the run. Yeah, you're definitely going to recognize every actor that pops up. We've all watched enough TV shows where, we, we, like, you'll see someone like, "Hey, I remember that person, that person that was in that thing." <laughs> Martha Plimpton. Martha Plimpton bought me a glass of wine. Um, really? Yeah. When I saw, went to see a play that um, she was in with a friend of mine. We went to the Ivy, which is a bit of a posh members-only club in London. After, yeah, and my friend suddenly saw a friend of his. And I kind of, oh, yeah, Lance, all right, you sit here. I've got to, I'll be back in a bit. And I kind of got stuck on a table with Martha Plinton and this other actress. And I didn't, I hadn't really been properly introduced to them. So I was a bit like, yeah. you know, when they go, so what do you do? <laughs> you know, you don't really want to say oh, I'm a playwright and a director because that normally <laughs> means, and I've got a great script for you is the next thing, you know. So I kind of, yeah, you know, I, I work in the industry. It just so happens. Kind of, just trying to play it down a bit. Um, I'll tell you, she was absolutely lovely. What a lovely woman. She was yeah. so nice. Um, it, was yes. not, it was lovely hanging out with her. And it, you were just sort of just chatting away like two regular people. And um, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm just I was never that keen on this actor, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, Diego Klattenhoff. Yeah, Donald, Donald Wrestler. He's in every season. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, he was all right. He kind of... I think the thing was, right, this came out <coughs> 2013 this started, didn't it? When did the last Born Identity film come out? Um, good question. Jason Bourne, I've never seen that too. Jason Bourne, look at it right now. I always felt like they were trying to make his character a bit too... Jason Bourne was 2016. Jason 2016. 
Jason Bourne. Wow. It, I just I felt like there was a casting conversation. And someone said, "Can we cast someone who looks a bit like Matt yeah. Damon, but who's not as expensive?" Yeah. And that was who they went with. That's what we have to have with this task force. You know, uh, Donald Wrestler, he's like the hardcore, like, you know, straight up, up and up, like, you know, 4.0 GPA, by the book kind of guy. And Raymond's constantly been in the rules so much. <laughs> yeah. But I like I just, Harry. I like Harry Lennox as well. Like I said, the first two seasons, they don't give him much to do. But as the past four seasons said, I think he has the most airtime with uh, James Spader. And those two together, I'm just watching it like, wow, just it's, you know, so much like, hey, listen, it's, it's midnight. Let's let's pour a glass of scotch and talk about, you know, the morality of man and what's happening with the world. And I have to believe that men like Raymond Reddington exist in 2024. We just don't know about them. <laughs> Um, is that Thomas C. Howell? It is. I was about to say to, to wow. you, Northern, do you recognize that? Yeah, because yeah. uh, I saw my I think uh, last time I saw him in anything was um, the Punisher. And damn man, he, he's really he's really like grizzled out a bit more. As he's got he is a bit like that. Grizzly Man of the Mountain, and he was in Animal yeah. Kingdom playing a father of one of the love interests of one of the boys, like an, a retired cop, yeah, out of his depth. and um. I mean, he's still an, he's a phenomenal actor. I always loved him in The Hitcher. Yeah, it's so weird to think of this actor as that young boy in The Hitcher. Going no, to get so cool. And when you see him now, it's like, damn. He should be and in Red him. Dawn. Wolverines! Yeah, he kicks ass. <laughs> Sorry, getting carried away. Right. I've got the soundtrack to Red Dawn on vinyl, of course. Wow. Yeah, of course. That was the most expensive <laughs> album ever, and it was like eighty quid. Yeah, it was imported, and only one shop stocked it. When I where when I first saw it, <laughs> it was like two hundred pounds, and I was like, I'm not paying two hundred pound for a vinyl. <laughs> um, eventually, it got I got it cheaper, but man, yeah, that was yeah, they had, had some vinyl. controversy where the one season Lance they had to stop filming because of COVID and they filmed the last <laughs> two episodes with uh, voiceovers and animation, which it's like I get why people get upset, but like they said, we had to shut down production for a year and they, they it's like the middle of like you know, we have two episodes to go, so it's animated. It may seem kind of cheesy, but like you get why they did it for it, but we have to. Oh, they they animated two 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 episodes and yes, just, oh, okay, that yeah. kind of. Kind of like, look at that, John Noble from um, oh, Return it, of the it, King. There is, yeah, there's a lot of actors in, in, in ten seasons. You got like Stacey, Stacey, Stacey Keach is in it. You know. Oh, that yeah, and he's no longer with us. I don't think. I think he's, he's really. Uh, no. am I, oh, sure. my, no, no. I'm thinking of the guy that was in Extreme Prejudice. Um, Stop doing this, Lance. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. Wow, That's Stacey great. Keach is 82 years old. Holy yeah, not God. Stacey Keach. I'm thinking of um. Powers Booth, I always get them oh, mixed yeah, up. Yeah. Powers yeah. Booth, we oh. lost Powers Booth last year, I think. Yeah, we just watched him. In, uh, he was in MacGruber. Yeah, he was in <laughs> yeah. Red Dawn as well. It was uh, probably one of the few times where he played a good yeah. guy. Yeah, he, he's um, and that's that's he, he gives the one line <laughs> where uh, what about Europe? They're sitting this one out apart from England, pours water on fire, hisses, <laughs> but they won't last very long. That's that's all we get in Red Dawn. That's England's fighting, dying, basically. Yeah. Um, oh, I like that coat. Yeah. Well, um, we, should, it's we, should do a, we should do a special on the blacklist at some point. At some point, that's it. it but like Jay said, there's definitely some plot holes in certain seasons, but overall, I'm very happy with the show. But yeah, sometimes you get like... You get like there's too much going on at once. It's like, keep a straight story, guys. Don't start doing this. What if this? What if this? What if that? What if this? It's... You know, but overall, I still like it. Okay. All right. Um, I did say I'd mention 800 quickly, and I I, I will. Um, so let me have a look. Um, okay. So, so uh, 800, for anyone who hasn't seen it, is a Chinese war film based on a true story uh, about when 800 um, uh, Chinese soldiers yeah. are held up in a warehouse uh, during the battle for um, Shanghai in 1937. It was a particular, particularly strange battle because there was a neutral section of 
Shanghai where all the foreign embassies were, which couldn't be touched by the Japanese. And um, and that was right opposite this warehouse. Uh, and I think part of the reason that, that they occupied that warehouse was it was difficult for the Japanese um, Air Force to bomb it because they might accidentally bomb, you know, the American embassy or the British embassy or whatever. Uh, although they still try. And it's, it's kind of like a Zulu movie, you know, lots of guys holding one location. There's another Chinese movie that's very similar called, I think it's called 71 Into the Fire, uh, about 71 students at a combat academy holding out against the might of the army. Um, so this is similar. It's got some, I mean, it's a massive action film, basically. It's quite weird because the the, the Chinese soldiers in it are equipped predominantly with German um, style weaponry and and German design helmets. So it's quite unusual seeing all these Chinese soldiers defending this warehouse in Shanghai with German kit, um, which I'm I'm assuming is accurate. I don't claim to know this particular um, period of history well. Um, so the film's called The 800. Someone was asking in the chat. But is it is an incredibly well-made movie. Uh, like I said, I've got it on Blu-ray, but for the wrong region, uh, which is very unhelpful. Um, it's got a fantastic set, huge, huge set built to scale, um, including the sort of foreign section over the river. So, so, so just to give you an idea, this is a great shot to show, right? This building here <clears throat> is the warehouse that these guys are occupying with 800 soldiers. It's got bunkers on the roof and stuff. And the uh, Japanese forces are, are predominantly attacking it from around here, so out of shot. This area over here, this is the foreign um, occupied section of Shanghai where the various embassies and things are. So this section is a neutral zone. So if you can imagine being an American tourist staying in one of these hotels or drinking in one of these bars and you're basically watching a real life action film unfold, you know, with people getting killed and everything on the other side of the river from you and you can see it in all its glory. Quite a bizarre situation, but that's a really good photograph that establishes it all. And they built the... I mean, this is obviously a bit of a CGI map, but they built the warehouse to scale for the set. And they also built most of this riverfront as well. So the set for the film is ginormous. Um, and they make good use of it too. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's impossible to follow all the characters though. Yeah. I couldn't tell who was who half the time because they, they're all caked in mud. They've all got the same uniforms on. Yeah. Um, apparently they are, are, are accurate because there was a, uh, apparently to Darth Plato a lot of supplies from the west to China were sent from the west to China to oppose Japanese advance and I'm looking at photos of the real event as well and yep. it does look very similar to the German uniforms this is one bit where they avoid being snipered by putting a huge Nazi flag over these guys running supplies into the warehouse which is like a nuts scene um that's a flashback to some historical battle which i think is at the beginning of the narrative but it's yeah i mean it this is a big budget movie i think it was the number one film in china the year it came out it took a huge box office um if you like your history if you like your action i don't know how accurate it is um i'm told by some it was pretty accurate but i'm also told that those people might not have been there so who knows um or as Ridley Scott would say, were you there? That's the, see, this is the neutral section owned by the West. So like America, Britain, do you know what I mean? So it's like a miniature Western area that, that that's all neutral and the warehouse is just across from it. It's quite surreal. There you go. And that's it all lit up. So that's a real set all lit up at night. That's not CGI. That's the real set. <clears throat> and that's the that, that's the real warehouse set with the Japanese attacking it from the other side. Um, 
yeah, this is a this is a good movie, man. Really was good. Um, needless to say, a lot of people get killed, um, and occasionally, some people will try and get across the river to get to the neutral section of Shanghai, and the snipers will kill them. And there's lots of scenes of heroism oh. and yeah, and civilians unfortunately getting caught up in the mists as they always do in war. Um, sadly. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, I give it a solid eight and a half out of 10. Definitely worth your time if you haven't seen it. And if you're into that kind of stuff, right? So we're getting up there. Um, I think we'll start to wrap up. Has anyone else got anything else they want to plug? Uh, but not your own stuff, any other movies or shows? I mean, first, uh, some old school, uh, Magnum PI with Tom <laughs> Selleck. <laughs> I've been yeah, I'm trying to watch that recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I had that uh, theme tune in my last movie quiz. I figured I started watching today. You did recommend the uh, Netflix, the, gen the Gentleman, right? I did. I'm gonna start watching tonight then. I'm oh, it, it's good. It's really, it's it's, it's, yeah. it's it's really good. And I like that movie. I'm, at some point, we do a rewatch. I, I think the Gentleman's a good movie. And if you say the show's good, then all right, cool. Yeah, no, I I liked it. I thought it was good. Um, have, have you seen all the episodes of Magnum PI? Northern? Not all, not not all. Because uh, I, I watched the uh, repeats when it when they came on RTV four, but I always missed a few episodes because I was like working and uh, different shifts on the jobs. Check this out: serious Tom Selleck, yeah, comedy Tom Selleck, <laughs> serious. Comedy. <laughs> uh, always got the uh, shirt open. Gonna have that chest hair. What type of car is that, Northern? That he drives. I think it's a Corvette. A Ferrari Corvette. See, that could be a move. That could be a, a movie quiz question. So you know you've got to be all over that shit. Um. <coughs> yeah, Magnum Pi. Well, you know, can't go wrong with the old shows, can you? Here we go. Jay Goodman has said, it's a Ferrari 308 GTI. Uh, I was right about Ferrari then. Yeah, so you I'm a big, uh, I'm a big uh, expert on cars. You weren't too, too far off. All right, uh, let's do the rounds. Um, Blue, what you got coming up? Um, besides you and Shogun tomorrow, then Civil War. <coughs> um, pretty much it right now. Just filming or finishing my, my Monkey Man video and my Late Night with the Devil with Dave the Small Chin. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, we, well, we talked about late night. Oh, you're doing a special on late night. Well, I mean, just, just, I have to edit my review. So that's all. Okay. But, oh, and I finally, I was telling, well, I wrote Drinker about, because we both were playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I finally beat that game 108 hours total to beat that game. So I'm drained. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, you get what you pay for, man. It's, I thought it was a, from a gaming standpoint, masterpiece, and you know it's going to be up there. My my top thing of twenty twenty four. Just uh, be dumping a hundred hours into a video game. Holy crap! Mm. Okay, uh, Northern, what have you got coming up? Well, I've just uh, released on my uh, Miami Connection video as a. It's kind of like a guilty pleasures concept. So uh, I feel I need to investigate this. What is, what's it called? Miami Connection. It's <sighs> to describe the plot would uh, mean I have to shred any sanity I have. It's about a bunch of well, don't, don't describe the plot, but what what's the um oh you mean Miami Connection the movie in nineteen eighty seven? Yes. Oh you've done what you've done a review of that? Yes, it's a uh, guilty pleasure. It's such a Bad movie, but I can't help but love it. I mean, why can cannot I, I, speak I, English? But <laughs> I, I I remember this film, isn't it? Like really badly dubbed. It's yeah, yeah, especially why Kim but his his English is so terrible. You got Maurice James doing this uh, scene where he's crying over discovering that he's about he could about his dad from the past, and he's got his zip open for some reason while he's doing it it's so awkward it's hilarious and uh, I highly let's, recommend it. let's uh let's take a brief look at this uh 80s rock concert in the film um <laughs> we have our 
Freddie Mercury look alike. But we were talking about um, Carlito, uh, what's his name? Um, Sh Charlito Copley earlier. Yeah. And I, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but his, his, his long lost brother is in this sequence. He's going to turn up shortly. Look at this ninjas with guitars, black belts on stage. Not quite sure what's happening, but um, he's a red belt. So you've got to have a red belt in there. Wow, look at this editing. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, 80s hair. Got to miss that. There we go. And look, there he is, the long-lost brother of uh, Charlotte <laughs> Joe Copley. A friend. <laughs> really looks like him, man. If he existed in the 80s, that's what he looked like. I'm taking it that the woman on stage is love interest. <clears throat> these they, these look like the villains or something. Don't know what's going on, but um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, just, just start questioning it. Just just go along with every bit of nonsense that happens. Um... <laughs> yeah, he's the brother, but for some reason he gets jealous of her boyfriend. <laughs> it's like that's how it all comes. Not sure what's happening. Get used to that feeling for this movie, Lance. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think I feel that that's right up there with no retreat, no surrender. Yeah. Um, for films that uh, I don't want to revisit, I think I have seen it because it looks vaguely familiar. <coughs> so it's on, it's on YouTube for free. So so yeah, just it's there. It's there if whatever you need to see well, it. We'll be back tomorrow with Shogun. Um, I did watch the last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, but I want to do a special on Curb Your Enthusiasm, so I'm going to save talking about that for another time. Um, but tomorrow we'll be back with Shogun at 10 o'clock, oh, yeah. uh, talking about episode eight. So far, the show has been... One more to go. Uh, fantastic. Two more to go. Nine and ten. Really tomorrow's, episode, tomorrow's episode eight. We did seven last week. I thought they said there's only nine up. Hulu. No, there's ten. There's ten episodes. Okay, mess me up. Ten episodes. Right. Good. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's ten. So uh, we'll be back talking about Shogun tomorrow. Do join us then. Yeah. Uh, I've got um, not got too much coming up on this weekend because I wanted to keep the weekend free. Uh, but I think I might be doing a stream on Sunday to do with Hillsborough. It'll either be to do with the Hillsborough film or I might have some of the Hillsborough cast coming on to talk about my first play that took place in 1998. Either way, I'll be doing something on Sunday about Hillsborough. Um, so do tune in for that. Uh, do watch uh, Anne, the Anne Williams drama, if you haven't seen it. Four parts, very, very good. Yeah. I highly recommend it. It's on ITVX or alternative sources if you can't get it there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's it from us. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in, guys. Don't forget yeah. to like and subscribe. Uh, I might be on Gord King's channel a bit later talking about um, Forrest Gump. I can't wait. <clears throat> but I'm starting to lose my voice, so I don't know if I'll be on there too long. <laughs> um, but uh, until then, that's it from us. Okay. Yeah. See you tomorrow.